chapter three of our exercise physiology text introduces us to bioenergetics and metabolism. There's a roadmap of topics you can use as you're parsing out ideas from this chapter. <clears throat> metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in, the cell, in a cell. And, and then we sum those up over all the different cell types you have. We can classify all the reactions in two categories. Anabolic reactions, in which we're synthesizing more complex molecules from simpler ones and catabolic reactions in which we're breaking down uh, molecules into, into less complex ones. <clears throat> Bioenergetics is the process of converting the raw materials from our environment, the macromolecules of biological interest, mainly fats and carbohydrates, into energy that can be stored by the cell and used later. In order to really <clears throat> undertake this discussion, we should just quickly review a few aspects of, of cell structure. The cell membrane is just the seal on the outside of the cell, like a baggie. It's a semi-permeable membrane that separates the cytoplasm of the cell from the interstitial fluid, the fluid around the cells. It allows the cells to maintain a different internal environment. <clears throat> the nucleus is where the genes are located within the chromosomes. So every cell has 46 chromosomes worth thousands of genes. And the study of the genes and their regulation and their products is what we call molecular biology. <clears throat> the cytoplasm is the water within the cell, enclosed by the cell membrane, and everything dissolved and, and found. So in the cytoplasm we will find ions, sugars, amino acids, other small solutes, as well as larger solutes, proteins, and then finally organelles. <clears throat> For example, mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the nucleus. Um, or in the case of a skeleton, we'll also cell many nuclei. Uh, we'll take a look at what a sarcoplasmic reticulum is in just a sec. The cytoskeleton is what gives its, the cell its structural integrity. The, the cell membrane is just a seal, but the cytoskeleton is the structural sort of scaffolding of the cell. In muscle cells, it's mainly myofilaments, actin and myosin, but there are other cytoskeletal proteins found in other cells. The actin and myosin of muscle cells slide along one another, using energy to shorten the cells. That's what a muscle contraction is, so-called sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is an organelle like a labyrinthine network of tubes and sacs in which calcium ions are stored. That's where cells largely store calcium. There's no calcium in the cytoplasm of a resting cell, but lots of it stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it can be released on demand. <clears throat> Here's a little cartoon of a skeletal muscle cell, or muscle fiber, it's often called. And within the muscle fiber are organelles called myofibrils. Those are, the, those are the units of the cytoskeleton of a muscle cell. So all these lines you see are the actin and myosin filaments, and they are found in repeating structures within the myofibrils. And those are the filaments, again, that slide along one another to shorten and contract this muscle cell, and then often by some of them all, the muscle itself. In this muscle cell are a couple of populations of mitochondria. The mitochondria are the site where the, the big payoff in bioenergetics comes from. It's where the major amount of ATP is produced uh, in aerobic respiration, oxygen utilizing respiration. And we'll talk quite a bit about that this chapter. And here you can also see nuclei, myonuclei, as they were described earlier. And again, skeletal muscle cells have many, many nuclei. And here's a, just a little bit more elaborate cartoon of a muscle cell, again, showing the myofibrils, but also showing, encompassing the myofibrils, the blue colored structures are the parts of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They have 
some enlargements here you can see called the terminal cisterns and then the connecting kind of labyrinth of, of tubules. So together that's the sarcoplasmic reticulum where the calcium is stored. And it turns out that these purple lines are actually, they're tubes, microscopic tubes, but they are actually part of the cell membrane. If you look carefully, you can see little openings, little holes in the, in the uh, surface of the muscle cell. And those are the openings into these, these T-tubules, transverse tubules. So you could theoretically enter into one of these T-tubules and cross all the way through the muscle cell and out the other side without ever crossing the cell membrane. And so snuggled up against those T-tubules are the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But we'll have another chance to talk about that in much more detail in, in another chapter on muscles. So, <clears throat> molecular biology is the study of the genes, their regulation, and their products, and how we get their products. We've learned a lot about um, how cells work and, and so forth from molecular biology. Um, we know that proteins are chains of amino acids, we've mentioned, and the order or sequence of, of amino acids determines the properties of the protein, which in turn comes from the genetic code within each of the genes in the, in the, in the DNA chromosomes. So each gene is like a recipe for the sequence of amino acids that will make a protein. <clears throat> we ship out that information, that recipe, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm by copying it out in the form of, of messenger RNA, and then the ribosomes can actually read that sequence, if you will, and, and translate it into a protein. <clears throat> Exercise training makes results and changes. A lot of what we've learned from molecular biology is exactly what's going on when we challenge muscle cells by exercising, and then they adapt, they make changes. New proteins are synthesized. We're learning more and more about what actually happens, what genes are turned on and how during exercise that leads to the production of those new proteins. So molecular biology is the, is the um, study of these things, that, and you'll, a lot of what we will see in this chapter are discoveries using the tools of molecular biology. It was just a little um, cartoon depicting the fact that multiple specialties within biological science come together to form what we understand to, about cells and their functions and their adaptations. So let's look at the chemical reactions within cells because that's where all of our energy um, acquisition and, and production and utilization is going to occur. It's all about chemical reactions. Endergonic reactions are reactions that require energy to be added to the reactant so that then products will form. Exergonic reactions are those that release energy typically as more complex molecules are broken down into smaller ones. These reactions don't happen in a vacuum, they, they happen in the presence of each other, they're coupled reactions. So the liberation of energy from an, in an exergonic reaction is what actually drives the endergonic reaction, so we need one to do the other. Cells break down fuel molecules, releasing energy, exergonic reactions, and they capture that energy, and we'll see how they do that, and use it to drive endergonic reactions, to make ATP for cellular functions, or to make new proteins, as we just mentioned. All those things uh, require energy. <clears throat> One way of sort of imagining what's happening in the liberation of energy from a fuel molecule is using this staircase kind of analogy. C6H12O6 is the chemical formula of glucose, and if we if we get all the energy we can get from a glucose molecule, we'll be needing some oxygen. That's why that's drawn in there, aerobic respiration. And so as we break down this glucose molecule, we do it in stepwise form so that it's controlled. And every, at each step, we release some energy and capture it in a stable form that we can then use later. And capture it in a stepwise way until we reach the lowest energy content in our scenario is going to be in the form of carbon dioxide and water. Those products still have some energy inherent in them, but nothing that biologically we can do anything with. So we start out with a fuel molecule, 
oxidize it or break it down and wind up with the lowest energy form. Free energy, it looks like a rocket. All it's saying is on the, on the y-axis, higher energy up here, lower energy down here, and we're going to see what's happening. All the carbons in that, in, in that glucose molecule are winding, winding up right here. <clears throat> One cool thing to think about is, if we take some carbohydrate-rich material, a scrumple of a ball of paper and light it on fire, we're going to have the same net reaction happening. Glucose, the, the, the carbohydrate uh, part of the, of the paper product, is going to be converted to CO2 and water, and all the energy is going to be released. That's not very useful biologically, so we have an elaborate scheme using enzymes to do the exact same thing in a stepwise fashion in such a way that we can control it and, and capture the energy instead of just letting it all escape as heat. <clears throat> the gear analogy of coupled reactions is shown here. And what's happening here in this picture is the reactants are the fuel molecules that we take in. And so we break down those fuel molecules uh, into, into products, into smaller molecules, ultimately into CO2 and water. And <clears throat> In so doing, we release energy, and we often release the energy in the form of high-energy electrons. And as we do so, we're going to take those high-energy electrons and drive some other reactions. We're going to, for example, form ATP. So here we have a coupled reaction. We have an exergonic reaction happening, or reactions. We have, <coughs> excuse me, an endergonic reaction. Uh, taking a adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate and combining them to form ATP, an energy storage molecule uh, that has a high energy phosphate bond that we can utilize later. Release that energy back out to do things we want to do. <clears throat> Oxidation reduction reactions are the type of reactions that involve this transfer of energy, high energy electrons, which is transfer of electrons. So redox reactions are often referred to um, as fuel molecules are broken down. As I said, high energy electrons are released and transferred to other molecules. That's oxidation reduction. So oxidation is removing electrons. Reduction is adding electrons to a molecule. And they're always coupled. One can't happen without the other. So when one molecule loses electrons and is oxidized, at the same time, another molecule gains those same electrons that are transferred. They're not just able to float in limbo for a period. So that's what we mean by coupled reactions in this case, in the redox case. The electrons are actually transferred along with hydrogens. And oftentimes when you see a chemical reaction drawn out in a, in a chemical formula form, um, the hydrogens are the only things depicted. But I just want you to be sure to remember that it's the, it's the energy of the electrons that's the important thing that we're going to uh, transfer energy and uh, in our energy uh, production system. So, as we're producing and en releasing energy from our fuel molecules, um, we need ca a carrier initially to capture those electrons. They can't just exist in limbo, so we'll have a redox reaction. We'll have a carrier to grab those electrons, and then we'll be able to hang on to them and use them for something good later. Here are the two important electron carriers that'll, that we'll be discussing or, or just making reference to. NAD, nicotine adenine dinucleotide, uh, <coughs> using the carrier. And again, here we see NADH. That's the reduced form, but it doesn't show the electrons, but just know that it's reduced because it has now received electrons and the hydrogen. FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, um, is also a carrier, and the reduced form, when it receives electrons and hydrogens, it looks like this. But And so we're not mentioning the electrons again, but but, be, but do remember that those are the important, that's the important change that's taking place. That's what makes it a redox reaction indeed. Um, here's another little <coughs> depiction of, of NAD and FAD and, and the changes that occur as they are reduced by, by receiving electrons and hydrogens. This is just because chemistry is beautiful, isn't it? Look at those beautiful diagrams. You don't need to concern yourself with the structures of these molecules at all. Okay, so that's our, our introduction to bioenergetics, and we'll go further in the next section and talk more specifically 
about the chemical reactions, the sets of chemical reactions by which our fuel molecules are oxidized and releasing those electrons that can be used to reduce our carriers and ultimately how those electrons will be used to make ATP.